He is risen, risen indeed. God's richest blessings to you on this Easter day. The Old Testament lesson is Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 to 25. The epistle lesson from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 19 to 26. And the Holy Gospel is Luke's account of the resurrection, Luke chapter 24, reading verses 1 to 12. For our sermon text today, I'll be reading Acts chapter 16, verses 25 to 34. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house, and set food before them. And he rejoiced, along with his entire household, that he had believed in God. Heavenly Father, these are your words, and therefore they are the truth. We ask you to sanctify us by this truth. Amen. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he saw the end. He had been given one thing to do, and whether it was fair to say or not, he hadn't done it. Supposing that the prisoners had escaped, he knew that when the sun came up that morning, his life would be required of him. His hopes and the hopes of his family were over. In despair, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. What was the jailer thinking when he heard that? Is it true? Even if it was, why would he tell me? I may not have beaten him, but I too had a hand in his unjust treatment. I put his feet in the stocks, I put him in the darkest place. Why would he share this good news with me? The jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You saved me from death tonight, without a minute to spare. But what about tomorrow? What about the future? Is it too late to discover life? By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Already at midnight, at the darkest hour, in the darkest place, God was bringing life and immortality to light. Here in the depths of prison were two men, Paul and Silas, who had done nothing to deserve the rough treatment they had received. Yet they did not complain, they did not curse or swear, they did not portray themselves as men to be pitied. They were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And why not, when it was so different from the words they typically heard? After the great earthquake, after the foundations of the prison were shaken, all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. The natural outcome for what seemed like a natural disaster should have been twofold, freedom for the prisoners and death for the jailer. That's what the jailer thought according to his human observation. But neither of those things happened. Paul cried out in a loud voice and told him the good news. And the jailer listened to what Paul said and took him at his word. He didn't harm himself. Already he was putting trust in what God's messenger was saying to him. He was alive, but he was still shaking. 
he fell down before Paul and Silas and asked the most important question of all, What must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas didn't shrug the question off. They didn't say, What must you do to be saved? It would be a waste of time to tell you because it's too late for you already. They didn't say, You've got us all wrong. We're only telling you that you shouldn't kill yourself. That's as far as we can take you. If you're asking about anything beyond tonight or anything beyond this life, we don't know. That's something you'll have to figure out for yourself. That's not what they said. Paul and Silas had already told the jailer good news. Now they told him the best news of all. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. That night, the jailer of Philippi discovered life in the word of Christ. The women who set out for the tomb of Christ at early dawn on the first day of the week had already discovered life in him, or at least they thought they had. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. These women had seen that life and that light with their own eyes as they followed Jesus from Galilee to Jerusalem. They were witnesses to the power of his word and the beauty of his compassion. They were also witnesses to his suffering, death, and burial. As they prepared their spices and prepared themselves to go on serving the Lord Jesus, even though he was dead, what were they thinking? Is this how all life, even the best, holiest, most perfect life, ends? In death and defeat? A perplexing question, to say the least, but not as perplexing as what they found and what they did not find when they arrived at the tomb that Easter morning. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. Like the jailer before Paul and Silas, the women were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. They were too scared to speak. But the two men, two angels, two messengers of God, knew what the women wanted to ask. He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and, on the third day, rise. Jesus told you everything you were going to witness, and he meant everything. See for yourself, he is not here but has risen. And they remembered his words. For those bewildered, grieving women, life and immortality were brought back to light, rediscovered in the word of Christ, the risen Savior, and at once they shared the good news of this rediscovery. Returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Paul and Silas were not in dazzling apparel that night in Philippi, far from it. But they were two angels of God just the same, messengers sent to proclaim the good news to everyone in that dark prison. Though they were bruised and beaten, they could pray their prayers and sing their hymns to God at midnight because the joy of the resurrection was deep in their hearts. That's what made them different. That's what set them apart. That's why the prisoners were listening to them. They were practicing what Paul preached to the Corinthians in our epistle lesson when he said, If in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. At just the right time, before it was too late, the gracious will of God and the answer to the most important question of all were revealed to a sinner on the brink of eternal death. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Dear friends, this is a joyful Easter message for you, for me, and for all people. Put away your sword. Turn away from your human assumptions about life and death. Turn away from these worldly solutions to the troubles deep in your soul. 
Don't harm yourself. There's no need. The atoning sacrifice for your sin has already been made. Jesus has done all the good you couldn't do. And he suffered and died in your place. His atoning sacrifice for your sin has already been accepted. See for yourself, he is risen. He is the living Lord Jesus who has destroyed death. True life, eternal life, is not discovered by doing anything, but by believing in what the Lord Jesus has done for you and your household. That same night, through the word of Christ and by baptism into his death and resurrection, the jailer and his family discovered life. Instead of despair and the end of hope, there was the dawning of joy in the jailer's heart and in his home, the joy of the resurrection. And why not? Had he not been raised from the dead himself that very night? And look at how he shared the joy of discovering life in Jesus. First came believing, and then came doing. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced, along with his entire household, that he had believed in God. We read in Isaiah in our Old Testament lesson, They shall not labor in vain, or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord, and their descendants with them. This has always been God's gracious will for every man, woman, and child, not because he owes it to us, but for Jesus' sake. And for Jesus' sake, his will is still being fulfilled. God has brought life and immortality to light in us. He has brought the blessings of Easter, the joy of the resurrection, to our hearts and homes through the same means of grace, through the word of Christ, and by baptism into his holy name. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create, says the Lord. And as we rediscover life in the risen Savior this Easter morning, let's remember that this is joy worth sharing no matter where we find ourselves in this dark world. This is no idle tale. This is earth-shaking news for all people. The discovery of life itself, which you and I are sent to proclaim. The empty tomb of our Lord Jesus Christ means deliverance from evil, rescue from death, and the certain hope of resurrection and everlasting life for us and for our households, for those who have gone before us and for those who will come after us. There is no need to be perplexed about tomorrow or worry about the future. All doors will be opened everyone's bonds unfastened, all will be raised to life, life that has no end, by the word of Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him, and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. For Jesus' sake, amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.